All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hauke. I am from Berlin, Germany, and I am a software developer and uh, an electrical engineer, and I am here to tell you about WebPerl. Uh, so I'm going to give you some of the background, some of the uh, technical details of how it all works, uh, but I'm also going to show you um, how you can use it yourself. First, a few words about my employer. The uh, Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries is uh, the largest research institute for freshwaters in Germany and uh, worldwide. It is a leading institute in that area. Uh, so we cover areas uh, such as biodiversity, um, the impact of climate change, um, sustainable fisheries, things like that. Uh, and now, of course, you're wondering, what does this have to do with Pearl? Uh, well, one of the main focuses of the Institute is the uh, communication with the public, so uh, consulting with government agencies, consulting with businesses, informing the public. Uh, it includes the support of open access publications, and it includes the support of open source software, which is why I'm here today. So I'd like to thank my employer for giving me the time uh, to come and talk to you. And uh, of course, I want to thank all of the open source developers that uh, built the technology that I am building on top of. Uh, obviously, without all of these projects, uh, none of this would have been possible. So where did this all start? Uh, in around 94, 95, I wrote my first uh, Perl scripts. Those were CGI scripts without the CGI.pm module. Um, and, uh, you know, relatively early on, you would see this thing, JavaScript, uh, you could run code in the browser, uh, and, uh, it, you know, you had the idea relatively early on that, well, what if I could run other languages in the browser? For a while, there was a VB script. Um, for a while, there was actually an ActiveX plugin from ActiveState that would allow you to run Perl in the browser that unfortunately didn't live very long. Uh, but now, using some modern technologies, uh, I've been able to to uh, run Perl, both Perl 5 and Perl 6 in the browser uh, and uh, use it instead of JavaScript. So some of the background here, JavaScript, I don't think I have to say too much. Most people, I think, uh, know uh, about it. Uh, just to mention, you know, there, of course, have been over the years since its introduction, uh, a lot of uh, progress has been made on um, the standardization. Uh, a lot of browsers have adopted it, and not just browsers, other places too. And because it's so ubiquitous nowadays, uh, of course, a lot of work has been put into optimizing it. So uh, most uh, modern browsers will run JavaScript inside its own virtual machine. The next technology is ASM.js. And what this is is a strict subset of JavaScript. And browsers that support this and recognize it are able to compile it uh, so that it can run code much faster than regular JavaScript. So you can get uh, entire virtual machines in the browser, for example. Uh, the sort of evolution of this technology is uh, WebAssembly. And what WebAssembly is, is a bytecode format for the same virtual machine that runs JavaScript in your browser. So it's kind of its own language, but it's tightly integrated with JavaScript because uh, it runs in the same virtual machine. It has a couple of advantages over ASM.js. Uh, so for example, I tried building Perl to ASM.js at first, but per the Perl core does a lot of uh, unaligned memory access, which uh, wasn't possible in ASM.js, but was possible in WebAssembly. The uh, compiler that makes all of this possible is called mscripten. Uh, it is a compiler for C and C++ based on LLVM that can compile to uh, C, uh, sorry, that can compile to ASM.js and to WebAssembly. And it also provides a kind of virtual environment for the code that uh, is running. So um, that includes uh, a standard C library, it includes system calls that are emulated, and uh, it includes a virtual file system. System. So you can actually run, you know, there's legacy C code uh, that you can, a lot of legacy C code that you can compile directly to uh, run in the browser. And this is what I did uh, with the Perl 5 core. So it all starts, of course, with the Perl 5 sources. Um, it does have to be patched a little bit. Uh, developing these patches took quite a while, but it turns out that there's actually not too many changes needed to the Perl core to get it to compile under mscripten. Um, I mentioned that it's a C and C++ compiler, which means that you can add modules into Perl, uh, including modules with XS code. 
that works too. Um, I also wrote some glue code between Perl and JavaScript. Uh, I will talk a lot more about that on the next slides. And all of this I feed into a build script that I wrote that takes all of these inputs and uh, runs the mscript and compile process and uh, builds the Perl binary. Now, of course, you know that Perl doesn't just consist of the Perl binary. There's all the modules that to go along with it. And so I take the tree of modules that uh, is generated as part of the uh, build process. I uh, compact that a little bit to save space. So for example, I delete all the pod out of it. And uh, then I send that into the tool that mscripten provides to build the virtual file system. So all those modules will be available to the binary uh, in the virtual file system. The result of this is uh, four files. Uh, one of them is handwritten, that's uh, webperl.js. The other three are the generated files. mperl.js is sort of the bootstrap code uh, that uh, mscripten generates to load Perl. mperl.wasm is the Perl binary compiled to WebAssembly. And mperl.data is uh, the data of the virtual file system. To give you a little overview of how the glue code works, um, on the JavaScript side, there's webperl.js. That's the uh, JavaScript file that you would include into your HTML file. What it does is it looks for script tags um, of the type text Perl. If it finds them, it will uh, concatenate them into one big Perl script and run that. If it doesn't find any, then it won't run the interpreter, but you can control the interpreter with an object uh, called Perl. And, um, the webperl will load mperl.js, which in turn will automatically load mperl.wasm and mperl.data for you. Uh, and if you don't start the interpreter, these files are not loaded, um, so you don't waste any uh, bandwidth there. By default, standard output and standard error goes to the JavaScript console, um, but of course you can redirect that anywhere you like. Now on the Perl side of things, and by Perl side I mean now the Perl that is running in the browser, uh, there's webperl.pm. Uh, it provides two main functions and a couple of utility things. The first one is the JS function, uh, and the second thing is the class webperl.js object. I'll talk more about those on the next slides. Uh, maybe interesting to mention at this point, there is a uh, webperl.xs file that's behind uh, the pm file. And uh, this XS file, because it's being compiled by mscripten, does not only contain C code, it also contains JavaScript code, because that's sort of the na native language there. And uh, that's the internal interface between uh, Perl and JavaScript. And you can actually, this, uh, this presentation is online. You can um, look at, this is a link here. You can uh, look at the slides uh, later on and click on that if you want to see what that looks like. Now, I mentioned uh, the JS function, and this is sort of the main function that you would be using in uh, WebPerl. Normally, you would give it a string of JavaScript code. You can also give it an array reference and a hash reference, and I'll talk about what that does in a minute. Uh, but mainly, you would be giving it a string of JavaScript code. And the interesting thing is what happens with what the JavaScript code returns. So what happens with a return value? If that's just a Boolean, a string, a number, or an undefined value, those get copied over back into Perl, but the really interesting thing happens is what hap when j the JavaScript code returns an object, and that includes JavaScript function objects, which in Perl we would know as a code reference, and it includes um, uh, array objects, which are also objects in JavaScript. In this case, what gets passed back from JavaScript to uh, Perl, they don't get copied, but in a sort of reference is passed back to Perl. And then this reference is packed inside of a uh, object of type webperl.js object that's kind of a proxy object for the JavaScript object. And this uh, objects of this class, webperl.js object, you can use them like a hash reference, like an array reference, like a code reference, or like a normal uh, Perl object, meaning you can call methods on it. And what happens in the background here is that when you do these operations, it builds a string of JavaScript code um, that does the equivalent operation in JavaScript. So in Perl, it looks like you're working with a regular Perl object, but in the reality, in the background, you're working with the JavaScript object that is wrapped inside of that proxy object. 
to show you some more of the interaction uh, between Perl and JavaScript. Uh, here in the first line of code, we're calling the JS function. And uh, where I mentioned earlier, where you can pass uh, array references and hash references to this function. And uh, what it does is it will take the Perl data structure, copy that to JavaScript, create a new JavaScript object, and uh, then return a reference to that JavaScript object back to Perl. This is useful in some cases, uh, but normally we would be passing strings to the JS function, like we're doing here in the next line of code. So uh, this is uh, a string of JavaScript code, and uh, what it is doing is creating uh, a new anonymous JavaScript function. That's the return value of this piece of JavaScript code. That gets returned to Perl, and as I mentioned, it will be returned as a Perl object that we can then use as a code reference, which is what we're doing here. We're immediately calling that code reference and passing it five arguments. And uh, the interesting thing is what happens with these arguments that we are passing to this JavaScript function. The first three are uh, string array reference hash, re hash reference, and in general, values passed from Perl to JavaScript are currently uh, deep copied. So um, that you'll get a copy of that Perl data structure in JavaScript. And I say currently because in theory it would be possible to pass references from uh, to Perl objects to JavaScript, but that turns out to be pretty complicated to do and uh, it hasn't been necessary yet for me, so uh, that's why at the moment everything is deep copied. The one exception to this is code references. So Perl code references, when you pass those to JavaScript, something interesting happens here. Um, what happens is what JavaScript gets is a new JavaScript function. And this JavaScript function, when you call it in JavaScript, will call back into the original Perl subroutine. This is important for things like callbacks, like when you click a button in JavaScript uh, and you want to call back into Perl. That's possible. And this also supports uh, both arguments to the subroutine and return values from the subroutine in the same way that I've been describing. So in, uh, objects or in general data from uh, Perl to JavaScript gets copied and objects returned from JavaScript to Perl are wrapped inside of the proxy object. Also important to mention at this point, um, JavaScript uh, does not uh, have an equivalent of Perl's destroy method. So in other words, JavaScript will not let you know when uh, it is done using a function um, or any kind of object reference. And so Perl has to keep all of the code references that it passes to JavaScript alive um, because it doesn't know when they'll be freed. So if you are passing a lot of code references from Perl to JavaScript, unfortunately, that's something where you're going to have to manage the memory yourself. You're going to have to tell Perl when it can free those. Um, and this you know, shouldn't be a problem in most cases if you're just passing a few code references from Perl to JavaScript. Um, that's probably not a problem, but if you're doing a lot of it, then you would build yourself a memory leak if you don't manage that memory yourself. One more interesting thing here is, uh, you know, we got earlier, we got a object from JavaScript in this first line of code here. We got uh, an object from JavaScript into Perl. And now we're passing that same object back into JavaScript. And what happens here is that JavaScript will see the original JavaScript object. So they get passed through transparently. Um, you know, that's useful if you get objects from JavaScript and JavaScript uh, expects you to get the, to see those same objects back. They do get passed through transparently. Here's a slightly more practical example. Um, this is uh, up at the top. We have a normal piece of JavaScript code. What this is doing is it's uh, finding a button in the page, uh, adding an event listener for the click event, and registering a callback function What uh, that should happen when the user clicks the button. At the bottom, we see the equivalent uh, web Perl. It works exactly the same. Um, you see here I'm using the JS function to get the document object from JavaScript, which we can then use like a regular object in Perl. We call a method on it, which returns another object. We call another method on that. 
And um, here we're doing the same thing. We're registering a click handle, handler, except it's a Perl subroutine. So when you're clicking on this button in, uh, on the web page, you're actually internally calling a Perl subroutine, which is uh, how you can build uh, GUIs using this. Now, um, I uh, mentioned that uh, mScripten provides a kind of virtual environment to the code that it's running. And um, they, the, since it's running in the browser, there are a few limitations inherent from running it in the browser. Uh, it's a single process environment. There's no other binaries except for the Perl binary there. Um, so you can't use system, you can't use back ticks, you can't use piped open. Um, there is... Uh, but well, JavaScript is by default a single threaded environment. There are, of course, ways to do threading in JavaScript, uh, but I think those are still experimental in mscripten. So um, the Perl here is still without threading. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you, you know, again, single process environment, no fork uh, or any of the associated functions. And also mscripten doesn't support any signals except uh, for sig alarm. JavaScript is also, in general, uh, non-blocking uh, because anything, uh, whenever you run JavaScript, it blocks the browser, uh, so you cannot do uh, blocking I.O. Um, of course, the accessing the virtual file system works fine since that's just in the memory of the browser, but for example, you can't l uh, read lines from standard input or you can't do any blocking network I.O. And I've been thinking about maybe there's a way to work around that, um, but it's still just an idea that I have to try out. I've mentioned several times the virtual file system, and uh, this, uh, to the Perl process, this will look like a regular Unix file system. So um, you have, you know, there's a slash dev, there's a slash home, uh, and so on, uh, to make it sort of look like a regular file system. Um, and what happens here is it's basically just a data file that the browser downloads uh, and unpacks into its memory, and then you're operating in just in the memory of the browser. Uh, this, of course, means that if you you make any modifications to the file system, well, as soon as you close the browser window uh, or reload the page or whatever, the, the ch everything will be lost, the changes uh, will be lost, and you'll start with a fresh copy of the file system every time. Mscripten does provide a file system uh, based on the IndexedDB API, um, and uh, I do mount that in WebPerl, but that's also something the user can clear this at any time. The browser might clear it automatically. Uh, I think it doesn't work at all in private windows, uh, so this is also not really a permanent uh, file storage solution. Uh, so to uh, store files permanently, you will have to either offer them to the user for download or you can communicate with the web server and store files there. And um, of course, if you know, you, uh, depending on how you've designed your application, the, uh, the, the web server could be the local machine. Another important difference between uh, how uh, Perl works in Web Perl compared to normally uh, is the life cycle of the interpreter. So um, normally, if you write a GUI application in Perl, you would have some kind of a uh, main loop that you would call, and that handles all of the events. You know, you have timer events, click events, whatever. Um, and then once that's done, it'll return, and the Perl interpreter will exit. In Web Perl, Remember I said running any JavaScript and that includes running any web assembly will block the browser. So there's no way to implement a main loop in Perl. So what happens instead is that once the main Perl script is done, at this point, normally, the Perl interpreter would be shut down. You would run global destruction. It would run all the end blocks and so on, and the process would end. mscripten provides a special mode where uh, it will not end the process. So you basically just return from main, and the, everything stays in memory, and uh, the process is not destroyed. And uh, it's you, so you can still call things that are there, but the, the, the main function has ended. And so I've patched the interpreter that global destruction and uh, the end blocks and so on don't happen. Um, instead, the control just returns to the browser. And since the Perl interpreter is still there, just in sort of a suspended state, you can still call all of the callbacks that you registered. So all the Perl subroutines are still there. You can still call them and so on. Now, of course, this has a couple of consequences. Um, the browser window can be closed at basically any time. And there's practically nothing that JavaScript can do to prevent that. So at some point, 
point, it's very possible that your interpreter will just go away. So um, you can't rely on global destruction. You can't rely on end blocks being run. And also, so for example, if you're saving a file, you should give the user some visual feedback so that they know when it's safe to close the window. Um, you can end the Perl interpreter, that there is a function that I make available for that. So if you have, for example, a legacy script that you are porting to run in Web Perl, then uh, you can shut down the interpreter normally. The problem with that is that mscripten doesn't really provide a good way to restart a binary once you've ended it. So you basically only have one Perl interpreter per window, and once it's ended, you basically need to reload that window um, to restart Perl. There are workarounds for that that I'll talk about. Um, so to take a step back, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of the whole thing? Of course, it's Perl. It's my favorite language, and I hope it's your favorite language, too. Uh, if that's not enough for you, here are some more advantages. Um, it's one language on the server and on the client. You can reuse your libraries. Uh, this runs anywhere that WebAssembly runs, so most modern browsers. It also runs in Node.js. Uh, it is a sandboxed Perl. Normally, sandboxing Perl, you, there is a module called safe, uh, but it doesn't include, um, for example, uh, you loading modules and all that. You, this, in this case, you really have a Perl uh, with all the modules sandboxed, uh, which might be useful in some applications. Um, and since it's so tightly integrated with JavaScript, you can use whatever your favorite JavaScript library is. You can use it with jQuery, um, whatever, whatever plotting libraries, uh, or any other JavaScript library you can use in WebPerl. Now, unfortunately, nothing's perfect. Um, I've al already talked about uh, some of the limitations, sandboxed, single process environment, no forking, no recalling external processes, and so on. Um, it is a relatively large download. Uh, gzip compressed its four megabytes that need, need to be downloaded and unpacked, so it does have one or two seconds of startup time. Um, it is, of course, not quite as fast as native JavaScript and not quite as fast as native Perl. I did some really simple benchmarking, and a, a web Perl script uh, runs around three to four times slower than a, uh, the same script on natively, which, you know, if you're just doing GUI stuff, I don't think it's too bad. Um, and right now, uh, the interface between Perl and JavaScript involves copying a lot of strings back and forth between Perl and JavaScript, so uh, that's not super efficient. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to pass massive amounts of data back and forth between the two. But again, if you're writing a, a GUI application, usually that's not the case. And I already mentioned the interpreter can only be run once per page. Uh, there is a hack uh, where you can load Web Perl into an iframe and then reload the iframe independently of the main page. Um, and I have been thinking about uh, some other possible solutions for that. Um, but again, uh, if you're writing a GUI application, normally you would just start one interpreter and keep that alive. But if you're running, doing legacy things, then you might need multiple interpreters. So what this means for me is, at least in my opinion, uh, I think this could be useful for uh, long-running single-page applications. Uh, think, you know, Gmail or many other uh, web applications nowadays are just one page uh, where everything happens dynamically on that one page. I think uh, WebPro would be useful there. Uh, what's the status of the whole thing? It's, it's definitely still beta, and the main reason I say that is that uh, running the core test suite is pretty difficult at the moment. Um, the core test suite uses a lot of QX sprinkled throughout all of the tests. So I have been able to run some of the tests manually, and those look good, um, but uh, I still need to find a way to uh, somehow emulate or support QX uh, to run an external Perl so that I can run the test suite. And when I can do that, then I would feel more comfortable saying, OK, this, this probably isn't such so beta anymore. Um, of course, uh, during the course of a project like this, you have a lot of ideas. I wrote some of them down here under this link. Um, and some of the next things I want to work on is uh, I want to uh, integrate Perl 6 more tightly. Talk about that in a few minutes. Um, 
And uh, I've also been thinking about whether uh, web workers, which is a sort of JavaScript uh, threading system, uh, might be a possible solution to some of the things I mentioned earlier. Uh, so for example, it might be a way to support QX. Uh, maybe I can even do some blocking IO that way. We'll see, that's something I'm gonna try out soon. And of course, uh, you know, I, I can't really operate in a vacuum. The more uh, feedback I get, and not just questions and complaints, uh, just you know, the I kind of things that you might want to use this for, or maybe already are using it for, um, is good to hear because then I know what kind of things to focus on. So you know, feel free to talk to me anytime, send me an email, whatever. So to switch gears a little bit and talk about the Perl 6 support. This is not my project. Uh, this is by uh, Pavan Mulias and several others who have been working on Perl 6. There is a JavaScript backend to Rakuto called rakuto.js. And um, what this does is, uh, uh, Unlike uh, the Perl 5 web Perl that I've been talking about so far, this actually does translate uh, Perl 6 code to JavaScript. So it is a source to source compiler. And uh, interesting here, you might know Rakuto is written in NQP, which is a subset of Perl 6. And this means that the Rakuto.js backend can actually take the Rakuto compiler and it can translate that to JavaScript. So in your browser, you'll have a full Rakuto compiler, and that compiler can then take Perl 6 code and uh, translate that to JavaScript as well. So it's, it's pretty mind-blowing, and I think it's really cool. Um, at the moment, it's sort of uh, my, the support I have in WebPerl uh, needs to be patched in. It's just one file you need to, be, need to run. It's kind of, I've been playing with it. Um, and as I said, I'm probably going to integrate that more tightly soon. Uh, what I'm doing is basically just stealing the Perl 6 build uh, from the 6pad website and downloading that. Of course, it's possible for you to build your own uh, Perl 6. There are some instructions on these links here, these two links. Uh, you can click them on the presentation and uh, see how to build your own Rakuto.js if you want to bundle different modules, for example. Uh, on the JavaScript and HTML side, uh, I've made the API very similar to the Perl 5 one. Uh, it looks in, so you also just include webperl.js, and uh, it will look for script tags of type text Perl 6. If it finds them, it will run them. If it doesn't find them, then it provides an object named Raku that you can use to control the interpreter. And on the Perl 6 side, it's also quite similar to uh, the Perl 5. Uh, instead of the JS function, you have this function eval with the JavaScript argument, which you pass a string of JavaScript code. It will run that JavaScript code. The return value will be passed back to Perl. And then you can use that just like a regular Perl 6 object. So in this example here, we're uh, calling, uh, we're getting the window object and just calling a method on that as if it were a Perl 6 object. You can try all of this out yourself. Uh, it's available for a download at these uh, addresses here. Here are the quick install instructions. These are also on the, uh, on the website, so you can download this and play with it on your local machine. Um, and you can also play with it on the web. I have a couple of examples that I wanted to show. So uh, first of all, you can build your own Perl 5 web Perl. Uh, if you want to include different modules, I know uh, Max has built one with uh, text CSV XS, for example. Um, and uh, these instructions are here at this link. I don't think we need to go into detail there right now. Um, but the next thing is uh, a regex tester, and this one is actually written in Perl. So this is entirely Perl, not JavaScript, and uh, it allows you to test regular, regular expressions live in the browser. So this is all happening live in the browser without communication to the server. You have a full Perl running here, and you can use it to test your regular expressions. And because this is a full Perl, you can actually run the Perl uh, debugger on it. So I can just click this button and we get uh, in the browser without communication with the server, we get the full Perl uh, regular expression debugger. Um, yeah, so that's, and this is written entirely in Perl. The other thing is I have a, um, an editor that you can use to run Perl in the browser. This is designed to be embedded in other websites. So here this, you see this little 
dotted line here, this is actually an iframe that you can include in any page and it will uh, provides you with an, an, a little editor here. And uh, this uses uh, the, what I told you earlier, you can, um, where the hack where you can run an interpreter and then restart it by reloading an iframe, it does that internally so you can actually run one-liners in the browser. This, uh, you know, again, without communication with the server, it just takes a few seconds to reload WebPerl here. And uh, you can, uh, it includes input files, includes script files, and if I run this, then we can see down here standard output, output files, and so on. So, you know, this, the idea behind this was uh, this would, might be nice to include in like a tutorial website for Perl. Uh, this is written in JavaScript uh, in this case, but of course, I could have written it in Web Perl, but I didn't want to load multiple Perl interpreters. So um, this is written in JavaScript, but allows you to run one-liners. And finally, uh, one more example. Let's see, it's the one down here. Um, so I've talked about how you can uh, basically hide a Perl 5 function behind a JavaScript function, and you can hide a Perl 6 function behind a JavaScript function. And uh, you can call JavaScript functions from both Perls. So what this means is we can actually load both Perl 5 and Perl 6 in the same web page and then have them call each other through JavaScript. So here I have some Perl 5 code. I set up a little subroutine that I register in JavaScript. Uh, and then I provide a button uh, that calls what looks to the Perl 5 code like a Perl 5 object. But in reality, hiding behind it is a JavaScript object, and hiding behind that is a Perl 6 subroutine, which is down here. It's basically exactly the same thing, just a little Perl 6 subroutine, um, a, uh, a button handler, a click handler written in Perl 6. And again, it does the same thing. It calls a method on what to it looks like a Perl 6 object. But in reality, it's calling a JavaScript function. And behind that JavaScript function is a Perl 5 function. So we can actually call back and forth between the two, pass data between them. Uh, you know, so a uh, slightly crazy example, I know. But um, I thought it was still pretty cool. And I also think it's a, it's a good example of, if you haven't heard of it, Perl 11 is a kind of a philosophy, you, you could say, of bringing together the different Perl in implementations. So I thought this was a nice example of that. So I think uh, that's it. Uh, the, it's all online. Uh, everything I've talked about, you can read in the documentation. Um, the uh, slides are online. And uh, with that, are there any questions? Yes. So the question is, would it be possible to get from WebAssembly to Java? How, so how do you mean? Um, yeah. Uh, so with Perl 5, um, they would, it, the thing is that it is just a full Perl 5 interpreter and it is required. You can't compile Perl 5 to JavaScript. That's, that's what you mean, right? If, yeah. So the, the compiled uh, Perl 5 script or? The what? Mm. Well, in like I said, in Perl five, it's uh, you get the um, uh, you have to basically run the Perl five interpreter, and uh, that's I, I I mean in theory it might be possible to uh, run the Perl five interpreter to a certain uh, point and, and suspend it and then release that, but uh, I think that would be pretty complicated to do uh, compared to just running it. So I. I uh, like I said, the Perl 5 basically requires the interpreter to be there. So uh, you need both the script and the interpreter there. Uh, in Perl 6, it's a little different. Uh, I, I haven't played with it enough to be able to say for sure. Um, but uh, I do think that um, it should be possible there to basically transpile your Perl 6 to JavaScript and then release that. You know, that, that should be possible there, I think. Yes. 
Yeah. So the question was, uh, what about, you know, the Perl core test suite has some issues uh, with QX and what about CPAN modules? Mm. Uh, yeah, so it is, uh, CPAN modules, if, uh, as long as they don't use any of the things that I mentioned, so uh, calling external programs or threading or, or signals, uh, they work fine. So I actually do already compile uh, uh, one or two CPAN modules into WebPerl by default. Um, and even, uh, like I mentioned, Max has compiled a CPAN module with XS code into WebPerl. So all of that works fine. It's just the question is, do do the modules or do the test suite use any of the features that uh, just aren't available, you know, due to the nature of the browser? So it's QX, uh, system, piped open, uh, fork, wait, uh, any multi-threading, anything like that doesn't, or, or any uh, signals, uh, just that doesn't work. So any CPAN modules that use those, unfortunately, won't work. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you add, sorry, no, the answer is no. If you add separate modules, uh, they get included into the mperl.data file. So it all gets built uh, with the, um, let's see. So um, when you add CPAN modules, uh, it basically goes through the same build process and they will be output as part of the Perl 5 module tree because you can include CPAN modules when you're building Perl. Nor I mean, normally most people know, uh, you know, you install CPAN modules after you've installed Perl, but it's actually possible to include CPAN modules in the regular uh, build process of the Perl 5 binary, and that's what I'm doing here. So before I build the Perl 5 binary, I download the CPAN modules, put them in the right places so that the Perl build process finds them, and then uh, they are basically become part of the Perl build process. So XX modules get linked uh, statically into the Perl binary, and uh, the uh, module, the PM files and so on, become a part of the output of the Perl 5 build process. And so those get packed all together in the same data file. So if you want to add modules, you do have to rebuild Perl. Um, but uh, I mean, I hope, uh, Max, I hope it wasn't too difficult. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I basically provide one build script that you have to run uh, to, to do that. Um, yeah, question. Okay, so the question is, am I using this for anything? And um, not other than these examples that I showed you, the, the regex tester and the, and the, uh, um, the demo editor there, uh, I am not really using it yet for like, I, you know, I, I work at a research institute, so we don't really have production. <laughs> that, um, but uh, so I've been playing with it a lot. Uh, and um, I, I do plan on writing a, uh, couple of user interfaces with it. Uh, so m I hope to talk about that next year. <laughs> uh, that's a project that I'll be working on in the next few months. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, uh, like I said, other than these examples, uh, I don't really have anything in production yet. <laughs> yet, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What is my preference for Perl? Ah, uh, okay. Well, for my re yeah, for my work, um, I basically because uh, I've been I mean I've been using Perl for a uh, long time. You know, like I mentioned, ninety five, ninety six, uh, and I've I've worked with other languages in the meantime, and Perl has always just been my favorite language. And uh, so at uh, the Research Institute, it's basically just, you know, we use whatever works for us. And um, so that's why I've been able to use Perl for my work. And uh, that's why I, you know, this, this I, the whole idea for Web Perl actually came out of, I was writing a GUI in JavaScript and it just, you know, was kept getting more and more JavaScript code. And it, you know, started getting a little annoying. And so I, I was like, what, I really wish I could use Perl for this. And uh, then that's kind of what, how this, this whole project started in the first place. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's personal preference, and uh, of course, um, JavaScript won't uh, be replaced by Perl anytime soon. Uh, although that would be interesting if that happens, um, but. Uh, you, there are a lot of other languages actually that are being compiled uh, to uh, using uh, using mscript and there's actually a list if you search for I, I don't remember the name of the repository but there's a repository somewhere on github um, of all the different languages that have already been ported to WebAssembly using mscript and so Lua is out I think there's probably a version of Python out there and so on so I think you'll see more and more languages um, replacing JavaScript like this. And then it's just the same questions you usually have when choosing a language. You know, what what do people know? What can we support? And so on. So that's that's basically the idea here. It's it's just another option for Perl programmers who don't want to write JavaScript, I think. Yeah? yeah. No, this this was just me. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so yeah, the question is: re restarting Perl takes uh, a second or two. Um, I think that most of that is uh, the uh, size of the files. So unpacked uh, Web Perl is 16 megabytes. And it just it does have to re uh, basically reload those, and uh, that's I think where most of the startup time comes from. No, it. Yeah, yeah, but even then, even then, it's still quite a bit of data. So uh, it, I think I think I did some brief testing, and that that's what it looked like to me. I, I don't think there's anything else playing in there. It's it's really just the size of the files, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you you wrote that possibility yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, sorry. Apparently, my screen has decided to lock itself. Um, so yes, uh, loading Perl, Perl modules dynamically over the network. So uh, the thing there is that um, the modules with XS code do have to be linked statically in. So um, the, uh, that you can't load dynamically. MScript does support experimental dynamic loading of modules. Uh, and I did try it out, but there were a lot of issues there um, with, uh, it, since it was still experimental, um, I think the issue at the time was that if you enabled the dynamic module loading, then it wouldn't work with um, the, dy the dynamic memory expansion didn't work, which of course is a problem. Um, pure Perl modules, it would be possible to, uh, to uh, reload, uh, to load dynamically. The thing there is that JavaScript is mostly asynchronous. So um, you, if you're loading modules dynamically, um, then you basically have to wait until those are loaded before you can continue uh, with the Perl script. So uh, there are a couple of approaches there that, that are possible. Um, so the one approach would be to load everything before you start the Perl interpreter. In that case, it would be possible to load modules dynamically from different sources, uh, put those into mscripten's virtual file system, and then start up uh, the Perl interpreter. Um, the uh, other thing would be if, if Perl is already running, it becomes more complicated because um, the I know what you wrote, your example, uh, what it does is it does a synchronous uh, request to load the module, but on the uh, JavaScript main threads, those are actually deprecated. So synchronous requests uh, are, are basically deprecated in JavaScript because they block the browser. So, um, but that, on the other hand, that's the only way to block the Perl interpreter. Um, 
So this, this other possibility I mentioned, I want to look into web workers. Since they run in the background, they don't have this restriction of saying, uh, well, synchronous requests are deprecated. So synchronous requests are not deprecated in web workers. So that might be a possibility there. If you're running the Perl in the background in a separate thread, that can block as much as it wants. It won't block the browser. So that might be a possibility. So I'm, I'm hoping that you know once I start playing with web workers, uh, you know, I'll, I hope that some of these issues like that might become easier so that you can say, okay, it's no problem to do synchronous requests that block Perl for loading modules from different sources, for example. Yeah. Does that, is that ad address what you were asking or? Yeah, yeah, you could say it that way, yeah. <laughs> and it only works for pure Perl modules. Any any other questions? I think w one more minute or so. Okay, so one more question. No? Okay, sorry. Time's up. <laughs> we can talk later. Like I said, come talk to me if you have any uh, questions about it. I'm I'm here the whole time. So thank you very much.